a 27-year-old male competitive hockey player presented with a one-year history of progressive hip pain and stiffness. These were not relieved with physical therapy. On physical exam, he demonstrated a flexion to 125 degrees, external rotation to 30 degrees, internal rotation to 10 degrees, and a 5 out of 5 strength with hip flexion, abduction, and adduction. The patient demonstrated positive subspine impingement as well as pain with flexion, abduction, and external rotation, and flexion, adduction, and internal rotation from 1 to 3 o'clock. He demonstrated no evidence of psoas, lateral rim, or posterior impingement. He demonstrated no pain with straight leg raise and showed no evidence of a circumduction clunk. Plain radiographs demonstrated tonus grade 0 hips with cam deformity. The off angle was 57 degrees, the lateral center edge angle 28.3 degrees, and the interior center edge angle 29 degrees. A magnetic resonance orthogram revealed an anterior superior labral tear and a discrete OCD lesion in the superior lateral portion of the acetabulum. At our institution, hip arthroscopy is performed with the patient in the supine position utilizing traction, a well padded perineal post, and fluoroscopy. The hip is subluxated with extension and adduction maneuvers. Typically, three portals are used for this procedure anterior lateral portal, mid anterior portal, and accessory anterior lateral portal, which is approximately 4 centimeters distal to the anterior lateral portal. These portals are created in standard fashion using cannulated instruments, which include spinal needle, guide wire, and trocars. Which portals are used ultimately depends on the position of the OCD lesion. Typically, the anterior lateral portal is used as a viewing portal, and the accessory anterior lateral portal is used as a working portal for curating, burring, drilling, and so on. Once portals are established, a diagnostic arthroscopy is performed with the use of a 70-degree arthroscope. In our case, diagnostic arthroscopy identified a 15 by 20 millimeter defect in the anterior superior portion of the acetabulum. After the chondral lesion is identified, unstable flaps of the cartilage are debrided with a shaver. Next. The rim of the cartilaginous defect is carefully cleaned with arthroscopic curettes to create stable cartilage shoulders that are perpendicular to the subchondral surface. These vertical walls help contain the marrow clot and create a load-bearing transition zone. Next, the calcified cartilage layer is removed with the use of curettes. Removal of this calcified layer affords for better clot adhesion. Care is taken not to disrupt the underlying subchondral plate. Following preparation of the defect, a flexible arthroscopic microfracture drill is used to make multiple perforations in the exposed subchondral bone. For this case, we use the microfracture osteochondral drill system by Stryker. Drill guides of varying angles are used to gain access to the lesion. Depth caps are assembled onto the guide handles to allow for drilling to a predetermined depth. The drill guide is placed against the surface of the lesion at a 90 degree angle and the hole is made by drilling through the guide continuously on full forward speed to a hard stop at the depth allowed by the pre-selected depth cap. This eliminates the need to approximate the depth of the drilling which is generally between 2 and 4 millimeters. This has been shown to be sufficient to access the marrow elements. After the hard stop, the drill is removed while continuing on full forward speed. Drill holes are first made around the periphery of the defect, adjacent to the healthy cartilage. Next, the defect is perforated with additional holes spaced at approximately 3 to 4 millimeters from each other in order to avoid combining the holes. As irrigation pressure is decreased, fat and blood droplets should be observed exiting the drill holes. Once the procedure is complete, the fluid is drained, and the capsule and portals are closed in the standard fashion.